Hello, and welcome to the Mississippi Valley Archaeology Center's UWL Archaeology Alumni Podcast. I'm MVAC archaeologist Cindy Kutchick. Through this series, we're connecting with alumni of the University of Wisconsin La Crosse Archaeology Program. We're getting perspectives on their experiences in the program, where life led them after graduation, and getting kind of a general perspective on the impacts of an education in archaeology. We're hoping to hear some great stories too along the way. Today, our guest is Dr. Jeremy Nino. He attended UWL from 1993 to 1997 and graduated with a Bachelor of Arts. He double majored in archeology span and history and minored in geography. His experience in professional archeology, span both academia and cultural resource management or CRM spans three decades. He has owned a CRM firm for the last 10 years and has served as editor, vice president, president, and immediate past president for the archaeology or of the Council for Minnesota Archaeology. Welcome, Jeremy. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Sydney. Sid, Cindy, Cindy, it's so good to be here. <laughs> yeah, we're so glad to have you and to hear about kind of what it was like to be in that sort of second generation our second cohort of archaeology students to come through here at UWL. Um, and sort of to start off, um, going off of that, what led you to uh, UWL's archaeology program and majoring in both archaeology and history? That's a great question. I grew up uh, in North Dakota, on the far western side of North Dakota in Minot. And as a young person, I got to go on a field trip when I was 12 years old in sixth grade. And I got to the, go to the uh, Fort uh, Bernhold Reservation and where Sitting Bull had been at. And uh, we got to walk through some fields while I was there and see the reservational area. And while I was uh, going through one of these fields, the students were, you know, little kids, we were like allowed to walk through. And I found some small pieces of chipstone debris and I found some small trade beads. And I asked my teacher what those were. And uh, he said, uh, Mr. Mellon said, you know, those are evidence of native peoples in the past. And I was completely hooked at that point. I, I went home after that field trip and I told my parents that I wanted to be an archaeologist. I didn't want to do anything else with my life. And really from there on out, it's it's the only thing I've ever wanted to do. Uh, when uh, we later, when we moved to southeastern Minnesota, when I was graduating from Plainview, Minnesota, down just north of Rochester, I had the opportunity to go with my social studies teacher, Mr. Emerson, and tour at a variety of different school uh, introduction nights. So there would be recruiters that would come from various universities. We drove down to a nearby school, and there was a recruiter for UW Lacrosse there. And this was in you know 1992, and and uh, she, I said that I was interested in archaeology, and I'd I'd already talked to several other. Uh, recruiters that were there from all over the area. I was a fairly good student in, in high school and I was at the top of the class and things like that. So I was pretty excited to be going on to college. Uh, and uh, she said, we have a program in archaeology and we just started it this year. Uh, so I, I immediately jumped on board. I was able to go to campus and Dr. Gallagher led me around on a, on a brief tour and I was completely hooked. Uh, I saw the lab I got to go to North Hall and and uh, go and see the archaeology where the department was, uh, and uh, paired with anthropology, of course. So from that point on, I, I knew Lacrosse was the school I wanted to go. I did apply to uh, University University of Chicago and uh, a few other colleges too, and I, I got accepted to those. Um, but Lacrosse was relatively nearby. It was a brand new program that was specifically in archaeology. And Dr. Gallagher and everybody that I met in that on that first trip, including other students that were in that first year program, uh, were very engaging and inviting. And I knew it was the place to go. So I graduated from high school on a Sunday, and I went to UW Lacrosse on the following Monday and enrolled in summer classes. And that first summer, while I was taking a uh, introduction to mathematics class and a history class. I think it was 1500 to ancient civ or something like that. Um, while I was taking those two, I had the opportunity to work at MVAC every day. Uh, at the time we were doing flotation work out on the curb, 
Um, uh, there was a child care center on the main floor of where now the, the lab is at. So every day I was, I was sitting there learning uh, about one little piece of archaeology, specifically flotation work, separating heavy and light fraction things, and sitting and talking with other people that were also brand new to archaeology. It was a wonderful early experience, and I worked for MVAC every part of my entire time well while there at UW La Crosse. Wow, that's excellent and so important to be able to gain that practical experience so early on. Can you tell us a little bit more about what it was like doing things like flotation? What were what materials were you working with and what sort of methods were you learning? Well, I mean, it was very early flotation, I would say. Everything in the in the lab at that time, uh, you know, it was it was cobbled together materials, tables, benches, any space that we could use. We had small, everybody had their small little individual little tables and whatnot with a little, with a little light source. And that's all you had. Uh, and lots of other students were there working alongside me from that first generation, like Molly Lyons and Wendy and Vicky and others that I know are, are at MVAC today. They've come full circle. Um, when I was doing flotation, we had a garden hose. We had a five-gallon bucket. We would put the heavy material into it. We would then uh, sift it through a muslin inside of a strainer. And we would strain off the the light and heavy fraction, and that was it. Like there wasn't a flotation machine, there wasn't anything that was doing that. I've, I've seen lots of really really good setups nowadays, but this was very old school. This was just sitting there and talking about what we were interested in doing at the time. I wanted to do medieval archaeology. That was going to be my mm -hmm. my really strong interest, uh, and you know, that was my big dream. And another student I know wanted to do work in Israel, and and uh, mm -hmm. we, you know we just we just sat and talked and. So we did we did uh, early flotation work. I didn't know anything about, you know, archaeology of the Midwest. I hadn't taken any classes in high school. I had general American history and civ and things like that, but I didn't really have any archaeological understanding or training. So really that first season was purely lab work and learning to identify what Native American, primarily Native, Native American materials looked like, you know, chipstone debris, pottery, and then going through the process of processing those processing those materials, taking photographs of them, putting them back into bags. I certainly wasn't at the level yet to be able to catalog anything. I remember uh, being taken out on my first uh, pedestrian survey in a plowed field, very excited. Uh, got you know jumped out of the vehicle. It was me and, and, a, and a professional that was there from from the MVAC uh, team and another student. And we walked in this field, and I was like, oh look, I, I found this, it, you know, here it is. This is, this is the, a, a perfect Native American, you know, you know, projectile point or something. And then she would calmly look at it and say, yep, that's a rock. Congratulations. You found a rock, put it back. And I was like, no, no, it's, it's I'm telling you, this is something. Uh, I, I was very certain that I'd found all these amazing tools, uh, which makes me chuckle because I've, in the last 30 years, I've done that many times since then. Uh, have taken out people and they're excited and they think they've found something and in fact it is just a rock. So learning that skill of determining what is cultural and what is natural, uh, I think the best way to gain that experience is through practical knowledge. Is you know not in a book. It's going out one on one or one on two uh, with a mentor and seeing where it is in the field or maybe doing flint napping and actually seeing how stone tools are made that way. Uh, that practical knowledge is very important and luckily. At least for me at that time, MVAC was a perfect window or place to do that. Everything was hands-on. I was working 20 hours a week during the school year and 40 hours a week during the summer and doing all aspects of archaeology. By the time I, I left MVAC, we were, you know, I was leading field schools. I was leading field surveys. I was very comfortable doing phase one and phase two identification and evaluation work. I was good at uh, cataloging. I'd had a great experience in both pre-contact and uh, contact period archaeology with a little bit of historical archaeology mixed in as well. And I knew by the time, most importantly, by the time I left, I knew what I wanted to do in the next part of my journey. So all of that training and experience came through practical knowledge that I obtained by working at MVAC. Excellent. And great to have that knowledge of being able to eventually make decisions in the field and be able to, to move on um, and upwards with that experience. And so at 
UWL, you got a lot of experience at MBAC. And did you take the local field school as well? Yes, absolutely. So I took field school in 1994, the summer of 94. Since the summer of 93, I was just a, a lab a lab intern for about, you know, just a grunt, um, cleaning things and making photocopies and, and doing things like that and just getting to learn who the team were and who the other students were and, and getting to understand them and get along. I was very green at that time, but I did take my first field school in 1994. I took it with uh, Dr. Thieler. We were at the Cade Farms uh, Farm area, which has a rock shelter and a and a middle woodland site on it as well. And I, we were there for quite some time. But I took a field school in '94. I then uh, went to I was in the Wisconsin and Scotland program in 1995, the spring semester. That's uh, I don't think that's a program that exists anymore today. However, it was an opportunity for students from all the different UW campuses. Uh, Eau Claire and Madison and and Stevens Point and whatnot to uh, go and experience uh, work and and learning in Edinburgh, uh, Scotland. So we were actually living in Dalkeith, just outside of Edinburgh. We were staying at the Duke of Buccleuch estate out there, and uh, so I took one class uh, while I was there, and the rest of the time I worked for the Center for Field Archaeology at the University of Edinburgh, and I worked for the National Trust um, for Scotland as well. So I got a lot of practical experience because I really wanted to do medieval or European archaeology at that time. Uh, I did not ultimately stay in medieval archaeology. Uh, when I got back, I, I realized that there were not a lot of European sites in North America, oddly enough, a couple of Viking things here and there, but not a lot of uh, context in context for me to do. But the good news is, is that out of that program, I did meet a young, uh, a lovely young lady uh, who eventually became my wife, and we've been married for over twenty years. So that was the that was the best find uh, of this my Scotland trip. But I had the experience to do archaeology in another country, and then when I came back from Scotland, it was already too late to do anything with the field school then. So I just worked uh, for MVAC full time that summer. Uh, we were working in southeastern Minnesota, uh, worked at uh, several different sites in, in the Spring Valley area. And then in, in 96 and 97, I was a field school supervisor for UW Lacrosse. Again, one of those seasons was, uh, let's see, one of those seasons was in Trempolo, I know. We did some work with, with uh, Ernie Bozart or Robert Bozart. And then in the next one, we did a field school up at Fort McCoy. And both of those field schools were really, as a, as a supervisor, were really pivotal in my own career. At the, at the first one where Ernie was doing work at uh, Trempolo, he was just at the beginning of his starting to his understanding of Oneota and other work at Trempolo. I was sent out to do some shovel testing in another part of the, um, the county park or the state park, the Perot State Park. And I was just let a couple of students out to do some shovel testing. And while we were doing shovel testing, I came across a very odd piece of stone that didn't look like any of the natural chur types that I was came to know and understand in, in Wisconsin. It certainly wasn't a piece of Hickston Slisified Sandstone or anything like that, but it was exotic. And I brought it to Ernie and, and he looked at it for one second and he said, this is a French gunflint. And so that, at that point, really sparked my interest. And so for the last two years of my time at MVAC, I worked uh, with Raleigh Rodell doing uh, fur trade work at Trempolo uh, State Park. And that's ultimately what I did my senior thesis on, which was a brand new un, uh, idea at that time as well to do senior thesis. So I did mine on our work at 47TR30 Perot's Post. Yeah, such a great experience there uh, going into to Trempolo and doing something totally new, it sounds like. So what was that like working on your thesis and the the seeing your thesis idea was something that was new? What was it like working with Raleigh Rodell and that process of doing a piece of original research? It was very challenging and very rewarding. Again, it, it all came through practical knowledge and experience. Raleigh and I worked very closely together. He was a great mentor and a great teacher. He he and I did uh, some some public field school work together and then some other regular field school work together. I was very interested in the actual time period that the French we were finding 
a very small number, but still a significant enough um, a collection of materials from there. And the story had always been that this was the, the for wintering camp for Nicholas Perot. Uh, and I apologize if I get a few of my facts uh, mixed up because this was quite some time ago. But Nicholas Perot was there. And uh, later on, there was a sent second wintering camp that was there for another fellow, uh, uh, René uh, Sierra de Lingteau. And René Godfrey, uh, he was there uh, quite a bit later in the, in the 1730s. And I think Perot was there in the 1680s. And my my the senior thesis was trying to figure out if we could actually uh, pin down where in time the French artifacts uh, came from that we had found. So we'd found a, a Jesuit ring, uh, some gun flints, as I mentioned before, some different types of trade beads. And from doing research on those, I was able to determine that they were actually later in time and they weren't from Nicholas Perot. And that was a, a really eye-opening moment for me. As a, as a scholar, and it really got me interested in doing historical archaeology. So that's what I've ultimately spent the rest of my career focused in. Historical archaeology was very new, and it had just almost gotten started the same time that CRM had gotten in the, in the late uh, 1960s. It was really just gaining steam in the, in the 1980s and the early 1990s, and there really weren't a lot of programs for historical archaeology, but I knew that's where I was going to launch to next. Um, to come full circle on that, uh, years and years later, I had the opportunity to write in the Wisconsin Archaeologist an article um, celebrating the work of Dr. Thieler, and I was uh, uh, given carte blanche to, to write an article. And what I did is I went back to my initial research that I'd done in 1996 and 1997 and really look at it through a set of fresh eyes and using something called a narrative perspective that was that's very popular in historical archaeology today a theoretical perspective i was able to realize that that all, for all of my excitement and interest in the french and the fur trade i had completely ignored the fact that very likely we really weren't looking at a, a french uh, wintering camp we were actually probably looking at a native american wintering camp we ignored a lot of native american archaeology that was present, and there are mound groups that are nearby and, and things of that nature. Certainly lots of Oneota and other presents that were there for, for several hundred years, thousands of years before the fur trade came along. And so I was able to rewrite some of my own work uh, from a much more um, learned or experienced position and, and really write a very new chapter in what I thought about the archaeology of Trempolo. So it was a really good experience to do first to do that initial work, get really excited about the French fur trade, do a lot of interesting things in that. But then as a as a more learned scholar, after having my master's degree and my PhD, come back, look at that knowledge again and realize that there is more to this story than what I focused on as a, a young undergraduate 20 plus years earlier and to really tell a more complete story. There's always something new to find when you look back from a fresh perspective so great great to to hear about that and to incorporate more of the the recognition of the uh, indigenous remains out there too wonderful uh, so you went on then uh to graduate school and studied historical archaeology uh, but you didn't stay in the midwest you went out um, to the college of william and mary in Virginia, what was that like going somewhere new, but pursuing something you were really interested in? Yeah, so just prior to my going out, um, after I graduated from UW La Crosse, I spent the next 16 months actually working for Fort McCoy in central Wisconsin. They had an archaeology. We had actually done a field school out there the summer before. And then once I graduated, I was asked by uh, Del Greek and Karen Caldwell, if I wanted to join their archaeology program that they were running, doing cultural resource management for uh, for Fort McCoy, a very large total warfare training facility in central Wisconsin. And uh, so I, I eagerly took that uh, opportunity. It was a, a nice little pay raise, uh, and I got a chance to to live in a little bit different area. My wife and I moved out uh, to that to to Sparta and lived there for almost two years. 
And I uh, really got my first true taste of, for better or for worse, what it's like to do cultural resource management, rapidly moving from project to project, not spending a lot of time doing research and fully engaging with things, but really doing compliance work, making sure that resources were identified and protected to the best of our ability before moving to the next topic. And that that was challenging, but it was a great experience. And, and I really quickly realized that I wanted to get a master's degree. Ultimately, I still wanted to get a PhD and I really wanted to become a, a professor of archeology. span And that was really something that was instilled in me by Dr. Gallagher, who encouraged a lot of his students to, to take that passion and, and engage with the wider public. So that's a big primary focus, I think, of MVAC and the program even to this day is the engagement with the public, uh, doing artifact okay. shows and displays and things like that, which are also was instilled in me. So long story short, going to, uh, work in Virginia and specifically in Williamsburg, the home of Colonial Williamsburg, but also the the home of the College of William and Mary, which is the second oldest college in the United States. Yes, Harvard is 50 years older, but I mean, still second. That's not too bad. Um, very I'm different very, experience. Yeah. A, a status-based school, uh, definitely not engaged with the public, doing research work. They did not have a CRM uh, wing. Uh, we were we were doing archaeology for Colonial Williamsburg itself, which was almost exclusively research driven work. I mean, amazing work. I mean, I got to dig at the Hallam Theater and and at uh, coffee houses and places where George Washington and and many others uh, trampled on a daily basis, which was fantastic and instilled in me a love in, of Colonial America that I still have to this day. Uh, but the the difference was was huge, uh, less collegial, um, more competition. And there was a very strong, one of the reasons I, I actually was accepted to the program, I applied almost on a lark, but I mean, actually, I applied to uh, William & Mary, I applied to the University of Boston, I applied to um, the University of Maine, uh, and, and another school as well. And actually, on my honeymoon, we with my wife, we drove and visited all those colleges that I've been accepted into to decide which one I was going to go to school at. So that was a really great uh, honeymoon experience touring all the East Coast, um, because all of the schools, with the exception of Chicago, um, really all the schools for historical archaeology are on the coasts, either East Coast or West Coast. Uh, there is not, even to this day, there is very little drive to do historical archaeology in the central part of our our state, and that's why it's it's great to see in the last couple of years, especially. Um, the Wisconsin Archaeologist has really tried to highlight more historical projects, and that's been really good to see in the journal. And the same thing here, too, in Minnesota. Um, but going out to the, the East Coast, very just not Midwestern, right? Uh, we we are passive aggressive here in, in, in the Midwest, but we're, we're pleasant, I think, on the whole. And I got a different experience of grad, uh, going to grad school in a competitive place with people with larger egos. Um, and that that was very interesting. I was going to go to get my graduate degree there, but ultimately didn't get accepted into the program and then uh, eventually came back to the Midwest. And also 9-11 happened between mm -hmm. between my master's and my PhD. And I really did want to come home and, and be uh, with my family. Yeah, th there's a really big difference, I think, in between the East Coast and Midwest. But what I saw academically uh, one, there was a much more serious attention to, um, you know, where you were in the class, competition, um, performance, uh, that was less collegial. Uh, and one of the major differences as well, it was there was a strong focus on theoretical work and understanding. Theory was really at the core of what I did as a master's student. It was a terminal master's program. And they were just getting a PhD uh, rolling, which again, I ultimately did not uh, join. But in, in the Midwest, and specifically at UW-La Crosse, I got a really strong engagement in methods. I had, by the time I went to go get my master's degree, I already had five, almost six years of experience in both the field and the lab. And many of the students that I went to in my program with, there were, there were eight of us total in the master's program, they had very little experience. And one of the reasons why we all got accepted is because we had some amount of experience already beyond a field school, you know, maybe if it was just one or two extra years. So I certainly had the most experience of, of my class. And the reason they did that is because the school intentionally focused on theoretical work, 
And then when we did field schools there, which I, I engaged in field school work there as well, we did that exclusively for Colonial Williamsburg. And we were taking students and we were doing research work and looking at, uh, you know, sites, you know, in within Williamsburg itself, both the old Hallam Theater, as mentioned before. So that was a very different take. Uh, we did take, we did have a, a theory class, one theory class at UW-La Crosse that was taught quite early in the morning uh, by Dr. Thieler. And uh, that was, you know, that was one of the things that I didn't get a great experience in at UW that we can talk about. And maybe that's changed over the time uh, is we definitely got a methods approach and less of a theory. And then when I got to grad school, I really got hit overhead hard with the, uh, with the theory stick. So we did a lot of that. And my theoretical work there, my master's thesis was at looking at the development of the middle class in Colonial Williamsburg through the acquisition of certain types of goods, specifically pistols that I was looking at. And all of that work uh, had to be done from a theoretical perspective. So I had to do a deep dive into Marxism, which was the strong theoretical perspective at the time in um, historical archaeology. We were just coming out of the processual, post-processual debates, and we were strongly in the post-processual at that time. And Marxism had its grip on entirely on the on the field. So I was really focused or pushed to do that. Um, and that so that's very different. At at, uh, at La Crosse, we we got all the tools and skills that we needed to become good archaeologists, but we didn't do a lot of focusing on the mental side. And then when we got to when I got to William and Mary, it was all about the mental side, and the 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 practice of it was completely secondary. And you minored in geography at UWL as well as uh, your majors. Did that help you out in graduate school um, at all, having that background? Yeah, I mean, it was, I'll be honest, I mean, there's a lot of overlap with classes between archaeology, history, and geography, at least there oh, were yeah. back in the day. So it was very easy to complete those uh, those sort of classes as, as a mix. And I really was very focused on history. Again, I was going to do, uh, I was going to be a medieval archaeologist originally, and then I got very interested in the fur trade, and then ultimately colonial America. So I, you know, taking a major in history uh, worked out really well. Dr. Shavalis was teaching cl classes in ancient Israel, ancient Iraq. Uh, so I I really, you know, in ancient Rome, I, I, I really liked, enjoyed all those classes. And the geography work just put it all into perspective, being able to really read and understand maps, uh, know where you were, you know, in the country and in the world, and having that uh, three-part context, both the history of a place, the artifacts that go with it, and the visual representation of it through geography, um, it's a really good uh, set of degree, you know, degree work to do of both majors and minors, and I would hope that people continue to do that to this day. Yeah, a lot of work going on with geographic information systems and so much with technology added in there as well. GIS didn't even exist yet. Um, so the yeah. there were no GPS units or anything like that yet. It was all that was all exclusively the product of the military. I actually, when I was working at Fort McCoy, I became the base station coordinator or manager for the for the fort. And each day, we I had to print out an almanac that showed where in the sky the satellites were at so that people knew what time of day they could actually get a good enough satellite reading to figure out where they were. Mm -hmm. It's not like today where GPS always works. You don't have to worry about satellites. We have tons and tons of satellites now. We had very few with only seven or eight being in the, in the sky at one time over our part of Wisconsin. So uh, technology has certainly changed and improved. It certainly made doing locational things a lot easier. Now I can just take my handheld trimble out and, and do all kinds of locational work in the field. But at the same time, we've lost a little bit of that training. When I was a field school student, we learned how to actually you know use a transit and do total station work. And uh, very different from today's you know GPR, GPS work. But uh, as a PhD student, uh, that's where I was able to actually minor in GIS. 
And uh, I've continued to use that skill to this day. And it is a basic skill that everyone who works with me has to have an uh, understanding of in order to use in the field every day. It's the most practical thing that's come into archaeology since the Munsell book. <laughs> Yeah, so talk a bit more about that, getting GIS experience and moving on to eventually getting your PhD um, in Minnesota. Yeah, so I I uh, finished out my graduate work at uh, William & Mary for my master's degree, and I ultimately didn't uh, join that program. Uh, they were looking for uh, students that were good, that were wanting to stay on the East Coast and, and keep working there. I was very interested in coming back to the Midwest and taking all of the training that I'd received in both my undergraduate and my master's work and applying it in the Midwest. So uh, my wife was still working in Virginia. I actually came back to Minnesota and uh, started working in for a, for a major CRM company at the time, doing work in uh, Iowa, of all places, down in Dubuque. And one of the reasons why I was chosen uh, for that job, I applied to several different jobs. And I, I received that one. The reason was is because several of the people that were working for this particular um, CRM company that were down in Iowa were grad were were students and graduates from the UW Lacrosse program. So they knew me, and uh, they I had a you know I, so having that experience and having taught them in field school, I, I was leading very large teams for this uh, for this company down in Dubuque. We were doing a huge uh, phase two project around what was called the Southwest Arterial. It was a big highway project going around Dubuque at the time. So we were we spent almost an entire year down there living in hotels and, and things of that nature. And I worked with Ryan Letterly and, and several other people that are graduates of the UW program and who then went on to do lots of different kinds of archaeology and still be in it, which is fantastic. And some of the people are even today are, are state archaeologists some other places on the East Coast now, interestingly enough. But that that experience of being able to come back, uh, then 9-11 happened, as I mentioned, and then my wife moved back. And then I went to, after working for that CRM company, I did that for a little while, for a couple of years. And then 2004, I decided to go back and get my PhD. So I took some punctuated time off between each of my degrees. Undergrad, at least 16 months, and then graduate school, graduated in 2000, and, and then 2003, 2004, I went back. So I took several years off in between them. At that time, I still really wanted to be a teacher of archaeology. I love teaching as a whole. And so I really thought there was a potential there to do that. So that's why I went back to get my PhD. I already had the terminal master's. I was already qualified as a principal investigator here in the state of Minnesota to do both historic and pre-contact or prehistoric work, but I really wanted to get that training to be able to, to teach archaeology full-time. That was my goal. And what have you uh, been able to do since then, going to uh, the PhD level, accomplishing that? What eventually led you into starting your own CRM firm and how did you sort of navigate working, you know, academia and CRM and um, how that all worked out for you? Well, the good news is I never left CRM. Uh, you know, from that, from the very moment that I gradu you know, graduated from high school and I went to work right away at MVAC, I'd always, and even, even when I went to the East Coast and, and was going to school at William & Mary, I still worked for CRM companies while I was out there. Uh, so I had, I had never really left the field. When I came back and did my PhD work here in Minnesota, I focused on um, settlement success in southeastern Minnesota, my you know adopted hometown area around Plainview. And I was looking at why communities, why some communities on the frontier in the 1850s, the 1870s, why those towns made it and their neighbors didn't make it. So that's what I was really interested in. I knew that location, location, location was very important. That's why I minored in GIS and did a lot of locational work for my PhD. But I was I really had a good understanding of what I wanted to do. So I went through the program rather rapidly. I was in and out in four years, which is oh, wow. um, a little difficult for a PhD program. But I already had all of that knowledge from starting at Lacrosse and then getting all the theoretical work at William and Mary. I had a good grounding in both method and theory by the time I got to my PhD. So I didn't have to spend years of my time there trying to figure out where I belonged, where I fit in, what kind of research I should do, what's the theoretical perspectives available to me. 
So I was able to, to latch on very quickly into what I wanted to do and uh, spent two years doing my initial research and then did my writing. And then once I graduated in in uh, 2007 with my PhD from the University of Minnesota, a degree in anthropology. Um, they don't have an archaeology degree. It's just anthropology. I then started looking to try to find a job, a teaching, full-time teaching job in, in archaeology or anthropology. And unfortunately, there are very few teaching jobs in our chosen field. And this is something I really try to impress upon people that are interested in joining a PhD. Why do you want to get that degree? And if that degree, the purpose of it is to go on to be a teacher, realizing that if you look five or six years down the line, think about where it is that you want to teach and see the people that are there in that program, realize that people stay in academia a very long time. Uh, I think there's a good lesson to be learned there. I mean, so I was, you know, Connie Erzigian and and others were at MVAC and they're still there and they're still teaching and they're doing a wonderful job, but it's 30 years later, you know, for somebody like me. So understand that there, there aren't going to just be a whole bunch more teaching positions that are going to open in our field, although I think there really should be for cultural resource management. So I, I taught at community colleges. I taught at the College for Visual Arts. I taught at McNally Smith College of Music. I taught uh, at uh, Hamlin University, University of Minnesota. Ultimately, I split my time between MCTC or Minneapolis College and Inver Hills Community College. Ultimately got a full-time job at, at Inver Hills. Uh, just prior to that, there had been the Great Recession had happened. So a lot of people had lost their jobs. And they were going back to school to get new training. And so there was a huge explosion in course offerings at community colleges especially. So I had a, it was a great time to be a, to be a teacher. And then once that tapered off, then the positions dried up again. It is supply and demand. And so ultimately, I, I did not receive tenure in that system. And that was in 2014. So then I, I really sat back for a moment. I, I was very initially disheartened at that point. And I took some time to think about what it is I've always done in my career. And could I keep doing that? What, what things really brought, brought me joy and passion? And it turns out that cultural resource management was that thing all along. And so I decided to start my own company. And, and now, and that was October of 2014. We're coming up on 10 years now of running the company. I started it in my basement. I had no employees. Now I have a, a full office that I rent out. I have between employees and full-time contractors, about 10 people that work with me on a regular basis. Things have certainly exploded uh, during that time, and it's been a wonderful experience. But all of that started way back at UW-La Crosse, and then it moved through my career trajectory going into teaching, ultimately realizing the marketplace for teaching, and then going back to the thing that I'd gotten all those years of experience in, which has really been a game changer for me being able to get work here in Minnesota and the upper Midwest. Yeah, you laid that out so nicely kind of how the, that through line worked um is there anything else you'd like to share about running your own firm and like if students are coming up in uh archaeology at uwl now what are some of the things you think they really need to know or some of like the really important things you've touched on that hands-on experience um what do you need to know if you want to go on in crm and and that's the the goal for your career? That's a great question. That's something I really like to talk about as well. So we've got about three more hours here and I'll, I'll be done at that. <laughs> end of that. Rest uh, of the day will be good. <laughs> that's right. Rest of the day. Um, first of all, it, it should, I hope that people understand and, and that they realize at a, at a young age that uh, cultural resource management or CRM is the lion's share of all work in archaeology today. Although it began in the late 1960s and was strengthened through federal preservation laws, um, that is almost regulatory archaeology is almost all the work that we now do as archaeologists. Yes, there are people teaching archaeology. There may be some other individuals that are at uh, an historical society or something of that nature uh, who get to do research-based archaeology. All the rest of us do cultural resource management, and it's very it can be very fulfilling and rewarding as a career. And honestly, you can make a good amount of money at it as well if you have the experience and you stick with it. 
uh, through the through the years, what I've learned, and, and I still hire UW graduates to this day, um, I really look for individuals who have completed some field school, who are interested in doing archaeology in a CRM setting, uh, who have some understanding of background in the region that they're in. It's great to take classes and, and be interested in about Mesoamerica or Egypt or other places like that, but realize that you're probably not going to get a job as an Egyptologist. It's much more easy to get a job doing archaeology in La Crosse or the St. Paul Twin Cities area or someplace in a major metropolitan area here in the United States. So having a, a understanding, a cultural and uh, topographic understanding of one region of the United States is a really big driver for getting a job. So for me, it's always been either the Mid-Atlantic or the Upper Midwest. I haven't experienced a lot of work in the Southeast or the Southwest. I've specialized in those areas. And because of that, I routinely get a lot of work in this area. So as a graduate coming out, you have to realize that you're probably going to be doing CRM. It is a very different kind of archaeology in some ways. It's a lot of phase one work or survey, pedestrian survey, shovel testing. You might do formal units now and again through evaluation. Uh, but there aren't a lot of large mitigation or phase three projects that are out there. Most of your work is phase one and phase two. Uh, you have to be nimble on your feet and be able to move from project to project. Uh, you have to be able to work in lots of different environmental settings, uh, work on your, I would say work on your own, but that's not necessarily true. I never, at least in my company, no one ever works alone in the field. And we're always together with a buddy, but you have to be willing to be in the field uh, in all conditions. Uh, this, this last season was a great example. We were in, we were out doing work, digging holes in the ground in January, in February, in March, and now starting here in April, you know, we, the ground never froze here in Minnesota. So we kept working the entire time because that's what our clients needed us to do. So there's a, there's a big driver for that. Um, having that GIS experience is, is key. Everyone should have a basic understanding of GIS, and hopefully there are classes or a class that they can take to at least get a grounding in what is GIS. And then you can get the training from me or wherever you go for that first job. Um, being nimble in terms of doing lab work versus field work, being willing to do all aspects of the work, not just one small piece, because as a CRM uh, practitioner, you're doing all the aspects for your client. One day it might be washing artifacts. The next day it might be identifying artifacts. Maybe it's doing uh, lit reviews and going to a regulator and doing research and looking at old Sanborn maps or other types of insurance maps and figuring out what went through a parcel. So you have to be all over the place and willing to try and experience lots of different things. And if you have that nimble mindset and a basic understanding of geography, GIS, archaeology, history, uh, then you can easily get a job at, at an introductory level doing archaeology. And here in Minnesota, that uh, introductory field technician, that's a, usually a job that the person makes anywhere between $15 and $20 an hour to start, uh, which is interesting because I didn't make $20 an hour in my career until I already had a master's degree. So uh, inflation has happened a little bit and, and certainly pay has gone up for the better. When I started at uh, MVAC, minimum wage was $4.25. So I think that's probably changed a little bit in 30 years. Uh, but I did get a nice pay raise every year that I was working there with Connie, which was wonderful. Uh, but once you have that uh, basic level of knowledge and experience, and if you still want to do archaeology or cultural resource management, then I would strongly encourage that you get a master's degree. And there are lots of good terminal master's degree programs out there. Uh, that's the basic level that you need to be a principal investigator in the United States under the Secretary of Interior's uh, guidelines. And then here in Minnesota, they're a little bit higher. And we require a little bit more knowledge and understanding, but you can certainly get that with that master's degree. So being nimble of mind, being willing to do new experiences and having a basic understanding of the of the all aspects of archaeology and GIS would put you on a good footing. And then after that, if you'd want to go to graduate school, making sure that you've done some theoretical reading as well, because realize, realize that in master's school, you're going to be getting a lot of theory thrown at you. That's for sure. You need that mental piece as well as the practical experience. Any other closing uh, bits of advice for 
maybe students considering going into archaeology, maybe they're in high school now and looking at what they want to do, or even non-traditional um, students, people looking back uh, to go back to school and uh, cultivate that interest in archaeology. I, I would say the most important thing, the one piece of advice that I can give people, besides being okay with technology, which as you get older is, is a hard thing. One of the most important things you can do is build relationships and not be afraid to ask questions. So almost every person that I've hired over the last 10 years to work with me reached out to me and said, I'm interested in doing archaeology. I'm interested in doing what you do. I want to see that. Can I come volunteer with you to start? Or you know, can I get an introductory job? Or where could I go to find the experience so I can work with you? Um, or, hey, I, I went to this program. I know this person. You know this person. They said I should come and talk to you. Everything in our field, since it is a relatively small field with, with good job prospects, it is a who you know industry. And having and building and maintaining those relationships are key. Um, I'm very happy to say that I can still go to an archaeology conference. I can still see meet Vicky and Wendy and others that were there at MVAC, and I still know them. I still e regularly communicate with them via email. I still maintain a membership in Wisconsin and in the Archaeological Society. You have to maintain those relationships. It's a great thing in business, and it's a great thing in a person's career. Um, those relationships are the things that are going to get you jobs in the future, and those are they're also going to give you the pieces of advice that uh, will probably actually do the best good for you. Sometimes your, your teachers or professors or parents give you advice from a certain perspective that's good for them. Um, they may want you or encourage you to go on and get a PhD. They may encourage you to go to something to, to, get to make a lot of money. Um, but if you want a real experience and a real um, you know, question, answer, dialogue, and a really good advice from somebody, talk to your peers and talk to the people that you want to work with or who, the people that you want to be in the future. Uh, relationships are, is really the name of the game. And I'm I'm very proud of the relationships that I've been able to maintain with everybody at MVAC over the years. And to from the sidelines as an alumnist, being able to see the expansion, the changes in new faces at the teaching level. I had a wonderful um, conversation on the phone with Heather uh, Walder the other day for about an hour talking about her interests and what she's doing in historical archaeology there. Um, that was wonderful to hear and talk with her. And I hope to maybe be in a, a you know help her in a class at some point here in the future, but that relationship building beyond anything else that you do in school, all this, all you know, have a good driver's license, get good grades, have a good understanding of a technology and GIS. Beyond all of that, the base of that pyramid is relationship building. You have to be willing to be humble and um, build good relationships, and that's something that I had to learn the hard way uh, during my time at Lacrosse, and I'm very happy to say, and I can la I can think about it and laugh, but I'm very happy to have had people that were in the first class before me, Molly Lyons, Vicki Twindy, Wendy Holes, uh, Jeremy Burkhart. Um, those folks really took me down a peg or two and and said, hey, this we're, we're all in this together. We're all in the field doing work together. You've got to get along. Uh, you know, you're not you're not the smartest guy in the room anymore. Uh, and that relationship building I've taken to heart for the whole the entire rest of my career. What a great takeaway. So important that networking and relationships uh, piece of everything. So, well, thank you so much for uh, sharing all of your stories and perspectives today. It was great talking with you. It was an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Sydney, for having me on this. Cindy, thank you, Sydney. It's hard to say Cindy. <laughs> thank you for having me on the program. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, again, thank you for joining us and thank you all for listening or watching this episode. If you want to find out more about archaeology in general or specifically the upper Midwest, you can check out MVAC's website at uwlax.edu slash mvac. There are plenty of resources there. And as Jeremy said, you can ask questions, um, start exploring your interests and ask away. Uh, there's contact information there, and you can uh, find out uh, your archaeological queries. So thank you again, and we will see you next time.